Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Our speaker today is Greg Wright. Greg is the Engineering Director at Renewable Water Resources in Greenville. That is our regional sewer authority utility here, known as REWA. Greg received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Kentucky in 1980. He worked in Kentucky for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, then in Indianapolis, and then Western North Carolina for various engineering companies in wastewater and stormwater projects. He came to Rewa nine years ago, working his way up in the engineering department until he became the director almost four years ago. Today, Greg is going to tell us about a mostly unseen project that will have a profound effect on the future economic development of Greenville called Dig Greenville. Here's Greg. All righty, uh, before I go to my screen, I'm going to show you a piece of rock. This is uh, the size of the rock, looking in the palm of my hand, about that thick. This is the type of rock that gets cut out from underneath Greenville as the tunnel machine has moved its way under downtown. So I just wanted to give you a perspective that we basically are grinding up the rock into small pieces that can be used for have many other beneficial uses, and we can talk about that later. Let me share my screen. If I can do that right there. Um, there we go. Sorry. Are we seeing my screen? But or let me get it. I probably shared the wrong thing. <laughs> Bear with me. Shared my desktop probably. Uh, um, stop share. Let me share again. Um, well, yeah, Greg, we saw the um, presentation. This oh, did you? Okay. Did is pop up. We first saw your email, then we saw the presentation and you just want to hit start slideshow. Uh, are we, are we on the presentation now? I'm no, sorry. we're not. You'll need to share screen again. Uh, you okay. Did I'm sorry. All That's right. all right. Well, shoot. Uh, let me get that down. Go back to here. Well, if I can get there, um, should be able to. I don't know why I can't see the meeting. Oh. Hmm. Did you did you minimize the meeting? Is it down at the bottom? Somewhere? Yeah, I don't. Oh, here, it, up in the corner. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you for being so uh, so helpful. We've uh, learned a lot of troubleshooting this fall yeah. in our early classes. There we go. All righty, thank you. Now share screen. Okay. Okay. And then um, share. Yeah. Yes. Then I'm going to go here. Oops, wrong one. Too many things. Here we go. You should be able to see it now. Yes, we see it. All right. All right. There you go. Perfect. Well, I lost five minutes. <laughs> you should. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so we'll, this actually uh, is a photo of looking up from one of our tunnel drop shafts. This is this one is about a hundred foot deep. We're looking up out of the bottom, looking up into the sky. It's just sort of a, an idea of um, you know what it looks like from underground. Um, so. Uh, we had some mention earlier about who is REWA. We are the uh, a special purpose district. We're, we're not a, a private entity, but a governmental entity founded in 1925. Our primary purpose is to uh, treat the wastewater in, a, in a, our service area, which is primarily Greenville County, but also touches on four other surrounding counties. We have uh, you know about 150,000 customers, uh, and we have uh, annual uh, operating budget of close to $100 million a year, and we uh, spend about $80 million a year in capital improvements on the infrastructure. This infrastructure is at least, you know, in some places close to 100 years old. And uh, we are not Greenville Water. We are actually the sewer utility. Many times our name gets us confused with Greenville Water. 
Uh, we do have nine treatment plants. We call them wastewater resource recovery facilities. We have 83 pump stations, maybe 400 miles of sewer line in this service area. We also deal with 17 sewer subdistricts. These are cities and towns that are within this service area that have their own sewer collection system. And there's over 200 miles of those pipes that are out in the ground. So the city of Greenville, the city of Simpsonville, Berea, Parker, those entities have their own sewer system. They bring their waste to us and then we take, convey the waste to the wastewater treatment plants for cleanup and release back into the environment. Uh, so uh, i try to give you a little project overview. Uh, what you're actually looking at is the face of our tunneling machine as it punched through that drop shaft that I showed you at the beginning. These are actually, if you can see my pointer, these are actually the cutter heads that are being uh, used to grind the rock. And this access port right here that you see with the manhole in the middle is how men would, tr would access to the front of the machine to change these cutter heads out because they would wear down over time. So we had to, I think we did over 70 times of changing out these cutter heads when we did this project. So uh, this was the only way the man could go in and out to get out uh, to, to do the maintenance work on the machine. Uh, so how did we come up with this project? Well, we started by planning the watershed. We're always trying to look very far ahead. We started with a 2008 uh, watershed planning study that indicated we really need to provide additional capacity uh, for the Reedy River Basin and particularly, particularly through downtown Greenville. And so from there, we, we initiated a second study to look at what is actually going, what do we need to do to get through downtown Greenville? The original 2008 study was envisioning an open cut pipe like we you see most sewer lines put in and um, we just sort of felt that may not be the best solution for downtown Greenville and just as a point of note we have two sewer pipes that are literally one foot under the pavement right here on the Swamp Rabbit Trail right in front of all of these businesses and all this amenity that sits right here in Greenville so so going down through here and tearing this up was going to be really disruptive very problematic. My wife was going to not let me live there in the home anymore. So I, um, we looked at alternatives in order to provide the capacity for growth and development and to uh, solve um, any other sewer overflow issues that may be coming along with uh, poor, poorly maintained infrastructure from our, um, from all the sewers that are located in the, in the region. So we, we went, we, we've set some project goals. We certainly wanted to limit the environmental impacts. We wanted to develop something that was sustainable. We don't want to go back through downtown and keep working on it over and over again. If we can avoid it, we need to support the growth, but we need to provide increased sewer capacity. You'll, you'll hear me talk a little bit about why we needed to improve zoo parking. Uh, we wanted to um, foster partnerships with people and to promote our, the awareness of sewers and utilities and educate the public in what we do. So that's part of what today's about. Um, so we looked at 18 different alternatives. We looked at open cutting through in just traditional sewer construction through downtown. We looked at the tunnel, which we ultimately decided on. We looked at micro tunneling. Micro tunneling doesn't allow the machine to curve. The tunnel can be curved like a train track, but the micro tunneling has to go in straight shots and it can only go for limited lengths. We, we looked at potentially just storing the flow upstream, the extra flow upstream of downtown and just releasing it slowly in order to uh, not have to do anything. We looked at pumping the flow to another across the hill to another treatment facility and just basically removing the flow from downtown. We looked at, you know, do we look at any kind of treatment upstream of downtown to, to uh, create another treatment plant? Uh, we ultimately selected, we, we put all these alternatives into a selection model that took into account things other than um, the cost of construction. You know, we, we, we and so the, the pinwheel over here to the left, 
identifies how we weighted things. We looked at, you know, what was a good hydraulic solutions? What was the available property? You know, operation and maintenance concerns. What was the social and public impact on our decision? What was the environmental and permitting issues? So that we ultimately came up with a, a combined score that had capital cost plus economic factors melded together to make a decision. And, and it resulted overwhelmingly that we should spend another 13 to $14 million and do the tunnel now because it benefited the community. And so what, do, so what does the project look like? So we start in uh, Cleveland Park down here to the, to the uh, uh, right of my screen. We start down here in Cleveland Park Here's the Greenville Zoo, and we and we create what we call an access shaft. This gives us access to the starting point, and we board the sewer line following this red line under under as much as we could Ridgeland Drive. Found our way to Broad Street, went right by the Peace Center, went under the river a couple of times, right beside District West Apartments, and ultimately exited at the Croc Center uh, tennis courts. Uh, here, District West Apartments are here, and the, and the tennis complex is here. We were about 30 feet deep at the uh, at the what we call the access shaft, and we were about 100 feet deep at the drop shaft. So the sewage is going to the the sewer pipes are up high uh, up by the tennis courts. They drop down this drop shaft and go through the tunnel and connect to the existing sewer system that's down in Cleveland Park. Uh, we got, we were as deep as 130 feet under uh, McDaniel Avenue, and we were as shallow as about 30 feet, 35 feet here in part of Church Street as we constructed this project. And so here's where, and so the advantage of tunneling is that we really only disturbed two locations. The public really didn't know what we were doing except for these two locations. So this is the, this down in Cleveland Park, we needed to, we needed to basically take over this parking lot in order to stage the construction activities. This is the zoo in the background. And then up at the other end, here's district up on Westfield Street, here's the district uh, west apartment complex, here's the tennis courts, and we basically occupied this little green space right in here for construction of the drop, what we call the drop shaft. Here's the Swamp Rabbit Trail going by right here on uh, at Westfield Street. And so a tunnel boring machine is a, is a long assembly of equipment, over 250 feet worth of equipment strung out in this tunnel, uh, but it really comprises a cutter head and a thrust mechanism to be able to uh, move forward. This, this is the face of our cutting machine before it went into the tunnel. Uh, these are the cutting wheels that are, had to be changed out. And so the, this face, this cylinder rotates in a, in a clockwise manner um, very slowly. And there's a, there's a main thrusting uh, piston that pushes that cylinder forward to grind against the rock and it makes these scoring patterns. And so as you grind more and more into the rock, the rock will fracture and it will break off in those small pieces that you saw me hold up. And those pieces then will get collected through a conveyor system and run back 200 feet to where they can start to dump into mine cars, sort of like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We fill up the mine cars, we, um, we run them uh, out to the back end, back down to Cleveland Park, dump them, bring unloaded mine cars back up underneath, and we uh, and start grinding away again. And we have to put pressure on the side of the rock, just like you would drill a, uh, with a wood drill at your home. Something's got to provide the thrust, but something's also got to hold you in place while you provide that thrust. You're standing, you're, you're on your own weights sort of holding you in place. Well, we had to push, we had to push outward on the side of the rock. There were two big gripper shoes. These, these blue things come out and press sideways against the rock to hold the machine in place so it can sustain enough force in order to drive that cutter head forward and grind that rock. So, uh, and it can only go about five feet at a time before we have to stop and reposition the machine. So the cars are, 
the mine cars are just enough to fill up five feet worth of rock. And while they're taking the cars out to be dumped, we're repositioning the machine in the hole. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of a five foot at a time operation. Uh, a number of things on the left here, you have to go in to figure out just exactly what is a, uh, the machine type and uh, uh, strength of the machine, the horsepower of the machine necessary to build uh, the, uh, the tunnel. So there's a lot of things that go into this, a lot of testing we did. Uh, abrasivity was a big issue. We had a lot of high quartz content in this rock, so it made it very abrasive. That required uh, the, the disc cutters to be changed more frequently. Here's actually a picture on the right where you can see these disc cutters, and you can actually see a man in this space where he has come in to change these disc cutters. That's about how much room he had to change out these disc cutters. This is not our project. This is a different project. But um, you, you have to get in that gap to change these things out because they do wear down over time, depending on how hard the rock is. So one of the benefits, we talked about this, the, the zoo. This is our construction work area here, right down here to the uh, right in, in the sort of the bend of Cleveland Park. Uh, here's where the tunnel takes off, but we needed to occupy that parking lot to stage our construction. So we had, we worked with the city to go up to near uh, Washington Street and build 146 new parking spaces for them. So they were not uh, out of capacity or restricted in capacity for parking in, in down in uh, Cleveland Park while we were working on the project. So we had to do that early to, to create a place for us to work. Um, now, most of the activity, uh, a big portion of the activity is down in Cleveland Park, and we had neighborhood concerns. You know, we have to deal with, we have to worry about the zoo, we have to worry about the Ridgeland Drive neighborhood, the Cleveland Forest neighborhood, and, um, and there was another neighborhood to the south. We had the trail we had to worry about, how do we maintain trail traffic, all of that kind of stuff. So we had a series of meetings with neighbor with the neighborhoods to understand what their concerns were early on. And and you know you can see here we were there was a lots of concerns about noise and light and traffic and vibrations and you know damage to their property. You know how you know what's going to happen to the animals at the zoo? Uh, how are they going to react? Um, uh, what about the dust that comes off of this? Is that going to cause me health concerns? Uh, so we had to do a significant number of investigations. Uh, some of what we did was we went and did pre-blasting and pre-construction surveys for for any resident within a uh, portion of the uh, the drop uh, the, the access shaft down here in Cleveland Park, as well as. Uh, up here where we were coming out of the ground. And then anywhere the tunnel was not in the public right of way, these green or these uh, different colors in here, we, um, we did pre-construction pre surveys on those properties themselves for fear of uh, would the tunnel vibrate and create an issue and cause damage. So we went ahead and pre-surveyed it before we started construction, locked those surveys up in a in our attorney's office in a uh, to where nobody could get into them. Those surveys were not only exterior but interior of the house so that we could uh, understand uh, you know what the conditions were before we started and we kept them locked up to protect privacy of each individual and only opened them if we ever had a complaint come from us, from, from our activities. Um, we did a lot of geotechnical borings. This, this, this is a piece this, that you see this man holding is a five foot section of granite that we pulled out of the ground. We did a tremendous number of borings along the way in order to try to understand what the ge geology was, were there fracture zones, were there high groundwater, was there groundwater concerns that could flood the tunnel and create problems? Was there uh, the same thing, the abrasivity and the strength of the rock would all go into determining how big a machine we would need to do this. Um, so we did a lot of geotechnical investigations. We needed to have the right to go to do this tunnel. So we, we secured what we called subsurface 
easements, tunnel subsurface easements. Normally, a sewer pipe, if you look in the upper right corner, a sewer pipe is constructed up close to the top of the ground, maybe somewhere in here. And we have a sewer easement that controls that zone up high so that nothing gets built over top of it so we can, um, so we can come back and do maintenance if we have to. But the tunnel is 100 feet underground. So what we ended up doing was securing a subsurface easement sort of shown in relationship by this gray box. And, and in essence, what it said was, you can do, you property owner can do anything you want above this gray box. We don't care, do anything you want, but if you're, you cannot penetrate or construct anything down into this gray box because we have to protect the integrity of the tunnel itself. And so this, this could be 60, 70 feet of rock above us that the property owner could do anything they wanted with. We don't care, just don't get down here at the bottom where we have the tunnel. And and as you know, constructing in rock is very expensive. Most construction activities, if you find good solid granite, you don't dig down into it 20 or 30 feet to do anything because it's so expensive to do that. So it, it really, the tunnel location does not cause a concern for any construction activity that goes on above it. Uh, we also did noise modeling. This, this is the construction site where the tunneling, uh, a lot of the crane work and a lot of the construction activities, this is right down in Cleveland Park. And these, these circular bands represent decibel levels from construction activities. And the further you got away from the center here, the further out you got, the decibel levels would drop because of uh, you know sound dissipating over over distance and it and it can be impacted by a number of things you know the 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 wind and the and the leaf conditions uh, can can muffle or enhance um, sound so we were looking at at well how how does the sound stretch out here and what does that do to these neighborhoods you know where, where who do we impact and the zoo is sitting right here in the middle of this too and um, and so we've, what we ultimately found was that we needed to restrict um, uh, construction to uh, a daytime uh, activity. We, we did not need to do it at nights and weekends. Even though there was a lot of noise in the park from time to time when you're sleeping late at night and we tried to work, if we tried to work 24 hours a day, we could, we could potentially cause a problem with the neighborhood. So we ultimately had to restrict uh, construction to daytime activities. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking here, at, this is now down in Cleveland Park. This is the access shaft. This is actually Cleveland Drive you see on the left. Uh, the trail is all the way over on the left. And here's where we basically did, you know, the bulk of our construction activity work going down into this shaft, which is about 30, 35 feet deep. And so, we, we ran into a problem right off the bat. And, and so we, ha we had to construct what was called a starter tunnel. And, and we did a lot of geotechnical borings down here around this shaft to understand exactly what was going on with the uh, rock down here. And we did a boring way up at the top of the hill on Ridgeland Drive, but we did not tear up this hillside to get equipment up in here in order to probe the hillside to see what the rock was doing on the hillside. And uh, as it turns out, uh, things weren't what we assumed. And so when I look at this, if this is the shaft that the access shaft area here and as a tunnel moves along to the right, heading towards uh, Westfield Street, we found that instead of rock being about on this line where you see all these, uh, these uh, circles being placed, we found that it actually had weathered. The rock was there at one time, but over the centuries, the, the groundwater that hit on this hillside as it ran down, down the hill and percolated into the ground and into the soil. It basically turned the granite into really weathered stone that couldn't support itself on its own. So we had to build what was called a starter tunnel to protect, to get about 250 feet, somewhere right in this area, we had to protect about, get about 250 feet into the hillside before we could start the actual tunnel boring machine. And so a starter tunnel basically is a horizontal mined activity, mining activity. And this is a protective shield that was actually built 
by the contractor to protect his workers that would stand underneath, uh, work in, underneath here. Mm -hmm. And he could advance this shield forward. He could, he could, with hydraulic jacks, push this shield forward. And um, let me see if I can go back. Can I go previous? Yeah. So the machine itself, um, um, the, the, the shield itself has a series of um, uh, uh, plates that can get pushed out. They're represented by these colors here, these green and purple colors. And, these, and the cylinders that push them out are represented in these, uh, in these um, uh, horizontal um, pushing, thrusting cylinders are in that green. Anyway, this is what the shield looks like. These are the thrust cylinders that move it forward. Here's those plates out in front. And they're actually drilling horizontally charges into the rock in order to blast it two or three feet at a time. And then we had to pull this machine back out and we had to dig that rock out. And then we would shove the shield forward another two, three feet. And then we would dig that out. So we, we averaged about two feet a day in this activity for 250 feet. And then when we got into the boring machine, we probably averaged around 35 to 40 feet a day. So this was very slow and took us about seven months to get this uh, starter tunnel uh, constructed in order to get into good competent sound rock for the, uh, for the tunnel boring machine to work. So it sort of created a horseshoe effect to the start of the tunnel. We have um, steel ribs and, and wood beams in between, and we're grouting this, the surface to hold things together. As you're looking back out, this is looking backwards, back out into the uh, uh, access shaft. And that's what the face of the rock would look like. And here are those up at the top. You can see these little fingers or steel wedges that would be driven out to protect the workers as they got in here after we blasted this and it became a big pile of rock, we would have to suck that, you know, scoop that up and pull it back out of the tunnel. So the boring machine, this, again, this is a picture of our boring machine um, that we had on site. This is just, I don't, this, this right here is probably 20, 25 foot. This is the workhorse part of it. Uh, overall, we had about 200, like I said, 250 feet worth of um, equipment uh, strung out in the tunnel. So here's the drop shaft. Here's, here's the parking lot we overtook at the zoo. The zoo's up on the hillside here. Here's where we overtook the parking lot just to the south of the zoo. Here they're actually dropping the tunnel boring machine, lifting it down in, into the hole by this crane. Here comes Cleveland Drive along uh, the bottom of the page. Um, here's another picture of it going in, um, setting it up, putting the cutter head on it, you know, down into shaft before we start moving it forward. Here, now we're, now we're into shaft looking into the starter tunnel. You can see the horseshoe shape, but they're starting to move the equipment back up 250 feet into the hillside to get ready to start the boring machine. So when the boring machine is running, this is in the tunnel itself. This is right at the beginning or the start of the tunnel. The boring machine is has pretty close tolerances to the side of the of the tunnel itself. Um, now we're further back in. You can start to see some of the trailing equipment that gets gets put into the um, machine. These these are various uh, uh, cars that support that uh, bring supporting equipment. Uh, many times we, we could run into fractured areas that we needed to put some rock bolts into the ceiling to protect the workers from uh, it falling, rock falling on them. Uh, we had a big dust issue that we had to maintain because as we ground this rock down, it would be very dusty and you had to protect the workers' health and safety, as well as the any dust that could come out of the uh, out of the tunnel, so there was a lot of water and and uh, and uh, soap type foam that was sprayed on the cutting face to keep the dust down. Um, so we had about when we're when we're working in the tunnel, there were five to six workers in the tunnel in the tunnel itself while the machine was operating. Uh, here we're looking back backwards at the, uh, at towards us, towards the drop shaft. There's an air ventilation system. We have to pump air into this, into the tunnel to keep air fresh for the workers. We have to s exhaust air out of the tunnel. We have to bring power in to, 
to power the machine. It's powered by electrical energy from uh, the, the Duke's uh, power grid. We have to bring water and uh, communications into the machine, into the tunnel itself. So uh, this is a look at the tunnel itself. You've got the mine, the rail system at the bottom. You've got one of the ventilation pipes being shown on the left. You've got some power and communication and water cables on the right. And you can see the geology of the tunnel. When we bored through the tunnel, it was uh, just, it was really beautiful to look at uh, with the way the rocks have been formed over the, over the, you know, the decades of, uh, of uh, you know, existence. Uh, so as I said, the rock would come out the, the, down in Cleveland Park, they come out in these cars. This is a crane is picking it up and going to dump it over here into a big pile. And so this was what we called the, the muck pile. And, and so Rewa took all of this rock and brought it back to our plant site here at our main campus because we had space to store it. And we've been using it for many other activities that we do. So we did not... Um, we did not let the contractor take this. We decided we wanted to keep it. So we, we set up a hauling uh, contract to hang on to this rock because we can use it for things like bank stabilization, road bed uh, construction, trail. We've, we've used our rock to stabilize the trail here recently, um, the Swamp Rabbit Trail just downstream of our Malden Road plant because of um, uh, flooding that has occurred. And we've just taken rock out there and sort of restabilized the trail for the, for the county. Um, and we cannot sell the rock because that would bring us under a mining operation and a whole different set of environmental regulations. So Rewa can use it and we can, we can give it to other government agencies, but we can't sell it to anyone. Uh, here's another shot of the tunnel and you can see at the very crown, you can see where we've had to put some meshing in and some rock bolts. It's hard to see the bolts themselves, but there's some fractures here that have occurred that we wanna make sure nothing falls down on the workers as we go in and out of the tunnel as it was mined. And, and so this is where the mine cars would slide back up underneath this uh, system. The conveyors would dump into these mine cars uh, up underneath this framework. Um, here you can see, now this is the machine right up here at the top. This, and you can see the workers are all in here. You can see that it's a fairly tight setup when you get back up in there. There's maybe about an inch gap around the outside of the machine all the way around that is being bored by the, by the um, cutter heads. Now we worked our way upstream. This is up by the tennis courts. So we have a, we have to drop the sewage down into the, um, from infrastructure that's built high up on, uh, up by the, uh, tennis courts. We have to drop it down about 100 feet. So our drop shaft is being, you see a picture of our drop shaft being constructed here. This is our existing pipe infrastructure right here. We had to create what we call a diversion structure. So the tunnel is planned to be used only when we get high flows. Normal daily flows will still go through the existing infrastructure through downtown. We want to do that so we can keep as much of the solids and the grit and the debris that's in the sewer keep it in the pipe, keep it washing through. We don't want to put a lot of solids and grit and debris in the, in the, in the tunnel if we can avoid it. So the, the, when the flows come up and they start to surcharge the system, they come over to what's called a diversion structure and we skim the top of the, top of the water off and we, and we drop it down into the tunnel. And so that top water is free of a lot of that grit and debris that that can sometimes cause problems with sewer backups. Plus it allows us not to have to do a lot of maintenance. If we keep it more liquid, we don't have to do a lot of maintenance activities on the tunnel itself. We also created an odor control f structure here because gases could be generated by this activity. And so we have a way to scrub the sewer gas and not create an odor nuisance to the community. Again, to the left over here is gonna be the the Swamp Rabbit Trail. This is just an aerial view looking, uh, a shot from a drone looking down on the diversion structure to the left and, and the, the tunnel uh, itself. They're pouring a top slab here on this tunnel uh, shaft 
uh, right now. Uh, and this is sort of a look down in the tunnel, uh, looking down to the to the bottom. We will drop this sewer flow down through what's called a vortex drop structure. It basically is a an insert that goes in here, and it and it allows the sewage to swirl down a pipe. And when it hits gets to the bottom, it does it hits what's called a stilling well, and it basically does not release a significant amount of odors. If you were to drop sewage 70 feet, 80 feet down, it would, the splashing action would release a lot of sewer gases. Uh, the vortex drop structure we're inserting in here will prevent that from occurring. Uh, this is the face of uh, the tunnel head as it's about to penetrate the, um, the, uh, the, the drop shaft. You can see the concrete to the left and the right. This is where the, the tunnel actually came, came uh, out. You can see the cutter heads and the wear on them. This is our project manager, Jason Gillespie, standing in front of it to give you a sense of scale. Uh, we, hit the, we hit the target about one inch off in a horizontal direction and a vertical direction from where we wanted to, to land. So ah. we did very, very well. Uh, this is the machine coming out. It's, it doesn't look like it did when it went in, obviously. Um, so we bored the tunnel, uh, and that's what you're seeing here on the left. And on the right, what's going on right now is we're inserting a fiberglass pipe inside this tunnel in order to carry the wastewater. And that fiberglass pipe will be jointed for 6,000 feet. We'll have a, a, a 84 inch fiberglass pipe inside this uh, tunnel. Now there's a gap between the pipe and the and the rock and the and that gap will be grouted with a low cellular uh, structural concrete, low, low weight structural concrete that will uh, firm everything back up so that uh, when we're done, it's like the, it's like the earth formed around the, the fiberglass pipe when it was cooling so that there will be no gaps and in essence, no real reason to go back in there unless we had a major geological event here in Greenville that somehow created a shear zone to the tunnel. That would be the only issue that would really give us any concern. Um, and so what did this, what does this cost? This cost us about $50 million. The bulk of it's setting in the tunnel itself at about 37 million. Uh, like I said, we, uh, we, we probably spent $14 million more than we estimated if we'd have dug up downtown Greenville with the bigger pipes. Um, and, and over to the right is just sort of the breakdown of the various uh, activities. The bulk of the work is in the actual drilling of the tunnel and the starter tunnel that was 14 million and putting the pipe inside uh, the, uh, there's another eight to nine million. So, you know, about half of the construction is in the tunnel itself, but we had to make a lot of connections to the sewer on the upstream end and the downstream end. The advantage of this project was we can do it all in the dry. We don't have to connect to the existing infrastructure until the very end. We're, we ex expect that to occur in uh, May, June of this year, if everything continues to go on schedule, we will eventually put this tunnel live here in the next four to five months. So with that, I'm done and I'm available to answer any questions. Remember, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Does anybody have anything they want to share with us? Or Sarah, you may have something to start off. Well, Dan and Marge uh, asked a question. Do you read that in the chat? I can, I can read it. Can you? I think, Sarah, I think you need to read them to Greg. Okay, I'm um, Greg. Dan yes, asks, what is the life of the fiberglass line and how do you replace any breaks if they occur? Okay, the life of the fiberglass line is, um, is a 50 year, uh, it has a 50 year stated life expectancy only because it's been being made for about 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. We expect it to be, um, we expect it to last, you know, 
a hundred years. We, we believe this is a hundred year solution. We do not believe that the, uh, that the line itself will break for any reason associated with uh, ground shifting or movement or another utility drilling into it and, and hitting it. You know, many times in sewer construction, other utilities get constructed, other construction activities occur that can impact the buried infrastructure. Here, we're so deep and out of the way that we don't expect really that to be a problem. Okay. Steve Luck says, do you drop sewage into the tunnel itself or into a pipe inside the tunnel? In other words, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, so what? Stay clean. So basically what happens is you have a, uh, I, I, for sake of time, I didn't show you a graphic on this. Uh, we have an animation on it, but uh, what happens is that um, the flow will come in a pipe horizontally to the big, the 100 foot drop shaft, and it will hit a, what is in essence, a vertical pipe that will take the, um, the flow down to the bottom. And, and so as that flow turns from a horizontal position up high to a vertical drop, it actually has a, a spiral uh, channel approach to it that spins the flow around. And so it's sort of like, um, it's like a, a vortex or a whirlpool. And so if you can imagine looking at a vortex in water where you get a, uh, an opening down the middle, assume the pipe is, a, is, a, is a holding the, is on the exterior and there's a vortex action that's going on the inside of this pipe all the way down, swirling down like a whirlpool effect. And when it gets to the bottom, it hits a pool of water, what we call a stilling well, and that allows the odors to not be released, but it's not directly dropped into the shaft from 70 feet. No, it, it follows a pipe all the way down. Got it. You give very good explanations, Greg, thank you. Seth asks, the broken rock from the tunnel, what is it like to walk on compared to typical gravel on a trail? Well, it can be, um, it can be, uh, have sharp edges. It's not been finished. You know, sometimes when you talk about gravel that you get uh, from a quarry, they've done a lot to sort of finish it and shape it a little bit. Uh, it can have sharp edges, but generally what happens is it packs down um, very flat because of its flat nature. And there's still a lot of dust and fine particles that are in that rock and in that excavation. It doesn't all come out just in, in simple fractured pieces like I showed you earlier. So those, those dust and those smaller particles pack in around it. So when I walk on it, uh, it's no different than walking on a typical gravel road or typ a typical gravel trail uh, uh, because of all those fine particles pack in around it to, to basically make a, a solid surface. Got it. Okay, Marie Eldridge asks, is the work between the Commons and the Reedy River connected to this project? That's a very good question. It is not a part of the tunnel project, but it is a part of a bigger vision for sewer capacity uh, for Greenville. The 2008 study uh, that we, I referenced earlier identified sewer capacity needs all the way back up to Traveler's Rest. In other words, we needed to make pipes bigger. Those pipes have been in the ground, some of them since 1925, another pipe since 1957. So they've reached the end of their useful life. The study indicated we needed to, to replace them and also add capacity for future growth and development. So what we call the Unity Park Sewer Project, which is associated with the Unity Park construction by downtown Greenville, we went ahead and we have moved forward our sewer construction through Unity Park in order to get out of the way of the park because we did not want the park to be built. And then we come back in two years later and build a sewer pipe, tear up the park to build a, a new sewer pipe um, for increased capacity. So it is related. They're not the same project, but it's a separate project we bid that was about um, $12 million worth of work that we're having to do to, to get sewer through from the tunnel through the park and up to Bramlett mm -hmm. Avenue, I think it is. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. Vito Fiore asks, as the city grows, whoops, I just lost him. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Here we go. As the city grows, do you ever envision this tunnel 100% of the time? Do you ever envision using this tunnel 100% of the time? Uh, that's, a, that's another good question. We, uh, so what happens here is that we have projected uh, growth of, um, we've done a 50 year growth study and we, and ultimately when you look at the potential build out of the watershed of the Reedy River from uh, Traveler's Rest down to the tunnel itself, the existing pipe infrastructure through downtown has enough capacity to handle what goes on on an average day and, and also through lower uh, what we call rain storm events or rain events. You know, no sewer system is completely watertight. There are cracks and breaks throughout all the sewers in the community. And Greenville's no different than any other community on this. Um, so when it rains and the groundwater comes up, you get a lot of extra water that comes in through these defects of the pipe. That's why you have to constantly be reinvesting in your existing infrastructure. And Greenville is woefully behind in this. Uh, our sewer subdistricts are woefully behind in reinvesting in this infrastructure to keep the water out. Mm -hmm. So as water comes in during rain and the ground soaks up and starts letting water in these cracks and these defects, the sewer surcharge, they get more flow. So the tunnel allows that surcharge water to, to flow over some weirs and drop into the tunnel. That diversion structure up, upstream allows water to flow into the tunnel to give that surcharge water a place to go. So if we can hydraulically size that ec the pipe infrastructure that we're building up the watershed to get to the tunnel, we can drop more flow into the tunnel and send it down to the treatment plant. So the as a long answer, but the but the the basic answer here is that the existing infrastructure can handle anything that needs to come down the watershed that we can project for the, at least the next 50 years um, uh, in the existing pipe infrastructure. So when, when those rain events occur, the tunnel will become active uh, more frequently because uh, uh, more capacity, more average day capacity in the pipes means less room for storms in the existing pipes. So we have to put it into the tunnel. So I don't know if I made sense or not. I hope I did. <laughs> yes, I, I got you. Thank you. We've got three questions that have to do with the slope of the tunnel. Don Lineback, Mary Lynn, and somebody else ask, how much of a slope does the tunnel have from end to end? It, it drops. It's a very minimal slope. It drops about uh, six feet, over 6,000 feet. It meets the minimum slope requirements by construction standards for, um, you know, that are set up by the South Carolina uh, DHEC, uh, who are DEPA of, of South Carolina. Uh, it, again, it drops about six feet in that 6,000 feet. Actually, the tunnel stores, if you, the tunnel gives us about 1.7 million gallons worth of additional pipe storage capacity when it's full, which gives us added protection for pre preventing sewer overflows down in Cleveland Park and on the Reedy River as it heads its way towards uh, Malden Road. Right now, I don't see any other questions, but I have a couple of questions. Um, one, you talked about um, checking with all of the buildings and homes and so on around the area ahead of time. And did you have anybody say, hey, you damaged the rock or our house shifted or there's a crack in the wall and it must be your fault? How did, how did that handle, how did that go? Uh, we've had a couple. We've had, uh, we've had to go, we, we would get, we would field those complaints through a hotline we had set up for the project. I didn't really talk about a lot of the communication features we set up for the public for the project, but uh, there was a hotline and an interactive uh, website that, that people could go to. And and so we got complaints, a uh, couple. I remember one in uh, up on Ridgeland Drive and one across the park 
uh, where there was complaints from the homeowners uh, about potential damages. So that's where the pre-blast surveys came in or the pre-construction surveys come into effect. So we got a complaint. We go open up the envelope of the survey to see what was documented ahead of time. We go out with the, we go with the, we open those envelopes with the homeowner to look at it and say, well, this is what the condition was before. And yes, there's something different or no, there's nothing different depending on the situation. And we ultimately work out an arrangement with them. If we have created the problem, we work out an arrangement to get that problem fixed. So we've, I, I know of two complaints and I know of one that were down near Cleveland park. And I know of one um, that was a, a broken glass issue uh, that happened up near district nine West when we were trying to blast down, we, you know, we had to, to create that hundred foot drop shaft. We had to blast down to get, you know, down in that rock. So we had some construction, um, you know, blasting occurring on each end and, and some, and that was generally where that damage was concerned. Uh, for the most part, you couldn't tell where the, where you were under the tunnel, uh, you know, from the surface of the ground, there were a few people who said, well, I get in my basement, I can sort of, I can sort of feel it or hear it, <laughs> you know, but for the most part, uh, it's very, very low um, uh, vibration issue. We had, we had vibration monitors all along the route to measure the vibration of where we were at, you know, and trying to stay within our guidelines that we set for the contractor. So we haven't had any, any complaint that, uh, or an issue that's elevated to my level to try to resolve. So um, I think we've been able to handle that very well with the public. Um, Greg, this seems very unique to me. Were there other communities that you went to to see that they'd done something like this? And have others come to look at your project thinking about they might do it in their community? Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> my early, one of my earlier careers was working up in uh, the Midwest where there's a lot of sewer tunnels associated with combined sewer overflow projects that are being done in cities like Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Louisville, St. Louis, various um, Toledo, various Midwestern uh, communities. And uh, so I, uh, when we were doing this work, we arranged to go tour those to understand exactly what was going to be those impacts and pick their brains on issues. And so uh, I, there are sewer tunnels elsewhere. Charleston, South Carolina is another one. There are sewer tunnels all under Charleston, down below those buildings, those old historic buildings down in, they don't have rock. They have a really stiff clay called the Morrow. And um, the, we, so I've been down in the sewer tunnels in Charleston and in Indianapolis and Toledo in various places to look and understand what, the, what was required. The, all of those that I mentioned have a uniqueness to it they, in that they drop the sewage down, then they have to pump it back up the hill in order to uh, back, pump it back up to get it to the treatment plant that's back up on the surface. Uh, in our case, because of the waterfall, we had a unique opportunity to drop the sewage down and then connect it into lower infrastructure so that we don't have to pump it back up again to the plant. We already have, we, so, we, so we eliminated a mechanical process here that's normally associated with every other sewer tunnel that you'll hear about that once you drop it down in the ground this deep, you got to pump it back out. So we, we were able to bypass that with the, with the uniqueness of yeah. Greenville. And, uh, and so we have had others come. We've had other utilities come and take tours, and we have given presentations like this to numerous other technical agencies and groups, uh, not only regionally, but nationally on our project. Great. Two quick questions, and then we'll be finished. Uh, one, what is the status of our sewer lines as old as they are, and how are they being replaced and repaired? So that's a very good question. We, part of our role here is to project the growth and the development of the community and you know we're facing some significant growth coming our way we have we have watershed we basically have watershed planning models for each of our nine wastewater treatment plants we have studies on how areas we don't currently serve 
uh, will need to be served in the future outside of where we reach right now. And so all of that gives us a roadmap for how big our pipes should be in the future. And then we investigate, we do sewer uh, televising and inspection work on our existing infrastructure to investigate the condition of our pipes to see if, if they're in need of repair. And so when we find a situation where a pipe needs to be repaired, we look at the master planning to see, well, maybe we should be making the pipe bigger because of the anticipated growth coming. We'll, we'll actually make the pipe bigger instead of repairing the pipe. If it's in an area where we don't anticipate growth to come, we, could, we will go and repair that pipe itself. And there's a number of techniques that you can repair sewer infrastructure in what's called a trenchless approach, where you don't actually have to open up the street or open up the yard to fix it. You can go through the manholes and put liners inside the pipes and you can spray materials on the inside of manholes and you can, you can fix and repair pipes without tearing them up, tearing up the surface. Uh, it's a little more expensive to do that, but it's more, it's more, um, you know, uh, customer friendly. And, uh, and, and so when you don't need to increase capacity of a sewer system, you use those kind of techniques. But if you need to make a 12 inch pipe, 18 inches, because it's a bigger, bigger uh, flows are coming that way, you, you're pretty much forced to you know, dig them up and replace them with larger pipes at that point. Got it. Okay, last question. What percent of the total treatment at Malden will go through the tunnel? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> Malden Road plant treats about 16 million gallons a day on average. Um, the flow through um, down to, through the through downtown Greenville, coming from Traveler's Rest, uh, is about six million gallons. So that rough percentage is is uh, generally the average amount of flow that comes through downtown Greenville. Now the tunnel will probably get activated uh, a dozen times a year as the rains come up right now. Now it'll, it'll happen more often um, as we grow, but it, it isn't used every day. Most of the time the tunnel is going to be dry and not being utilized. Mm -hmm. And only when the rains come and the cracked infrastructure allows extra water in to the point that we could either burp it out the top of the manholes in Unity Park, or we can drop it down in the tunnel. The tunnel is there to allow the, that extra water to be dropped down in the tunnel and contained in the pipe infrastructure. But uh, for the most part, the tunnel is dry. I would say the tunnel is probably going to be dry 11 to 12 months out of the year. Amazing. The whole thing is quite impressive. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we appreciate all the work that you do. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be a part. Anybody can reach out to me for more information or questions at any time. Thank you. Great. Our meeting is over. We hope you'll come next week to our next Lunch and Learn. Bye now. Thank you.